are back for yet another week of Behind the Lens. Welcome. I am film critic Debbie Lynn Elias and creator and host of this glorious show, Behind the Lens. Uh, for all of our regular listeners, thank you so much for tuning in again. For all of our new listeners, uh, as we do every week, we go behind the lens and below the line with directors, with actors, with writers, composers, sound guys, cinematographers, and we, of course, our Star Wars countdown, which we'll get to in just a second with my my trusty cohort in the control booth, uh, sound engineer Brian. Hello, Brian. Hello. How are you? I am fantastic. I mean, last week we were so busy we didn't get to do Star Wars countdown. Last week... Um, I used a term to describe how great the program was, which on a family-friendly uh, standard, uh, <laughs> with our family-friendly standards, I can't repeat said word. <laughs> but yes, last last week's show, if you haven't picked it up, go ahead and, and look up Behind the Lens on iTunes. It's on our website. It's on MovieSharkDeBlore.com. MovieSharkDeBlore.com. Go ahead and pick it up, man, because that was a great show. It was guest after guest. We had the last ship. Uh, we had some of the actors from last, we the had last ship. We Al, Al Curnell and Emerson Brooks. From the last ship, which, and I know already from the Twitter feed, so many of us are going through last ship withdrawal uh, because we will have we don't have any more new episodes of last ship until sometime in 2017. Wow. Yeah, they start shooting in October, and I'm happy about that because they're around the corner from me, so I fully expect to have my body on for onset visits uh, once shooting is is up and running. Uh, but yeah, it, the show do, won't be back until 2017. It's a lengthy, lengthy process. But for what Stephen Kane uh, turns out, it is well worth the wait. And I fully expect uh, at next year's Emmys uh, to see some nominations for season three that just ended for The Last Ship. Because the writing is, is strong, if not stronger, than many of the Emmy winners that we just witnessed last night. Did you watch the Emmys? No, I was watching Green Bay Packers I, lose it, to the uh, stupid question. Stupid me. No, no, not stupid you. I, I listen. I, I forgot it was football. When when football season starts, I have to remind people not to bother me with their with their problems, with their wanting to hang out and be social, because I pay for direct shout out to Directv. I pay for the NFL Sunday ticket, oh. so I get every single game out of market, which I love watching. Plus, I lo- I've been lo- I lost two weeks in a row in fantasy football, so I've been pretty. I have to study up because I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be losing. No, you should not be. But I saw the winners on Twitter. I was watching as I was watching the football game. I had a Twitter feed going, so I was watching the Emmys happening on social media. Yeah. So you know, it was it was okay. You know, the viewership Nielsen reported was uh, last year was the lowest Emmys uh, recorded Emmys in television history. Well, this year dropped another four percent. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what the Television Academy does. And what ABC does with the Emmys uh, in, in future years. But, you know, I got to tell everybody, we've got some great guests coming up, not only today, but in the future. I just spent all day Saturday at the Mix event, Sound and Television and Film, hosted by Mix Magazine, Formosa Group, and Sony Studios, with the top sound guys in television and film today. And it was, you've already met one of them here on the show, Scott Hecker with Formosa Group. Scott uh, is actually getting ready in a month. He will start sound on Justice League. But uh, we're going to have some other guys from Formosa popping in here and then others uh, outside the Formosa Group uh, as as the, the months and weeks go by. And I'm very excited because listening to them uh, talk on some of these panels about using sound as a storytelling tool uh, just very insightful, and the creativity and the care that the sound department puts in your sound designers, your mixers, your editors, your ADR recording artists absolutely. Some t- in some cases, I think they're more dedicated to the storytelling craft than the directors of certain films are. Uh, that's how great their work is. And I was very excited to actually get a few minutes uh, for a one on one with Paula Fairfield, who not only sound designer on Game of Thrones, but the sound designer, sound editor on uh, Jonathan Jakubowicz's Hands of Stone with Edgar Ramirez and uh, Robert De Niro. So as the award season progresses, you will be hearing more about Paula and uh, maybe hear some of our excerpts 
on uh, from our interview, which was a total surprise on uh, Hands of Stone. But Brian's doing something. I don't know what Brian's doing. Are, are, Brian, are you are you ready to make our listeners happy? I am ready to give them somewhat what they want. Because we have crossed a milestone. We have, which we should have hit last week, but our action jam-packed program was uh, was not as important as this countdown. No, it's <laughs> no. Last week, like I said, I mean, last week's show, I went back and listened to it. It was great. And if you haven't, like, pick it up behind the lens, go iTunes. Subscribe to iTunes, guys. Don't just download it. Subscribe, comment, like. Yeah, Please. I mean, you know, it's got last week's show, Al Cornell, Emerson Brooks, and then Tara Carsian and Andrea Grano talking about the fabulous BFFs. It was, and Emerson and Al are BFFs, and Tara and Andrea are BFFs. So it kind of all came together in a BFF kind of thing last it, week. Yeah, and, and you can tell from each phone call that the people who were representing each program or the project that they were doing actually had a love for it. Yeah. So you go check it out. Check out that podcast. But today, I have this little sound. Of, I don't know what this It says Ascend Space. So let's see what that sounds like. Oh, that's Star Warsy, right? That's Star Warsy. That's Star Wars, you right? No. No, that's not. Okay. All right, Rogue One. I'm excited because last week we were on the threshold of the 90 mark. Today we're we're beyond that. We're 87 days, 12 hours and 53 minutes to go until Star Wars a Rogue One. A uh, Star Wars story Rogue One comes out. Now, I'm starting to see more merchandise come out. Yes. I I, I saw yes. uh, more uh, Felicity Jones posters coming mm-hmm. out. You, you tagged me in on Twitter. Mm-hmm. So things are getting serious. I think things are going to get more and more. Uh, they're going to start to roll as, and, as it goes. And uh, Brian is taking a break because I am sure that on that that phone ring in the background is undoubtedly our very first guest today, who we'll have momentarily. Writer director Matt Cooper of the ultra hilarious is that a gun in your pocket? Um, I laughed so hard I had tears streaming down my cheeks. So it's going to be great to talk to Matt in a couple minutes here. And then at the halfway mark of the show, we're going to have Nadia Litz, writer and director of The People Garden, a hauntingly, hauntingly beautiful film with Pamela Anderson, of all people, and breakout performance from Dre Hemingway. But before we get to Matt on the line, let's wrap, let's let's hear some more Star Wars here. Okay, uh, and just to wrap up, we also look at Star Wars Episode Eight come out, and that's Close. That one's closer than Rogue One, I think. 451 no, days, not. 12 hours, and 51 minutes to go for that one. That's further away. 400 days. Yeah, no. I know. Rogue One is 87. That one's... Oh, that's less. Yeah, uh, you did it backwards this I did. week. I did. He was so anxious to try and find some Star Warsy intro music. Yeah, we're, we we don't want to get sued. <laughs> that's right. We don't that, want... No copyright violations here. No, unless we get permission. But yeah, Rogue One, I'm starting to see more merchandise. Hopefully they do a tie-in deal with... Uh, I know they announced which ones they're going to do it with, but I hope we get like a McDonald's thing because I'd love to have some like action figures um, pop you, up. In, in Happy Meals. I'll, you, you don't have to buy the Happy Meals to get the toys. I would. I've learned that. No, I don't. I want my Big Mac. <laughs> I, I learned that shamelessly. I was like, how much for just a toy? They'll charge you for just a toy, but it's about the same price as with, with the food. Oh, my. So you might as well buy the little cheeseburger and the little the little apple dippers at that point <laughs> and, instead of just buying the toy. Yes, behind the lens. Not only do we go behind the lens and below the line, but we give you culinary tips, as, as Emerson Brooks did last week on wine selections. Who knew Emerson was a wine connoisseur? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Because you asked him how he owned wines after a program, and he says, wine. <laughs> that is how he owned wines, with a bottle of wine. wine. But, yeah, no, that was – and then Al was at the Emmys last night, and he was doing some FaceTiming with that, and he was having fun. But right now, let us move onward and upward with today's show. And a gentleman I'm very excited to talk to. Matt Cooper, writer, direct, writer, director, Matt Cooper. Matt, are you there? I am here, Debbie. How are you? I am so thrilled to talk to you because I am so in love with your movie. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you got a couple of laughs? Uh, uh, more than a couple. I was sitting in the chair laughing hysterically. There were points with Cloris Leachman that I had tears rolling down my cheeks. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> Just an absolute, this just packs a powerful comedic punch, and it is, it, it is beyond hilarious. It is one of the funniest films of the year. Oh, thank you. But what you have also done 
is you have very succinctly set forth every aspect of the gun control issue out there today. You, you s- explain everybody's positions, but you do it through laughter and comedy. Well, then, uh, then we accomplish what we set out to do. That's a great, great compliment. Um, it's funny because you'll have your people on the extreme right who are totally unhappy, think it's a you know, complete liberal mush. And then you have people on the far left who, thinks, who think that it you know, just doesn't go far enough, that we just didn't condemn you know, every gun owner. <clears throat> or uh, you know, present them in a in a stereotypical fashion, which we were very careful not to do. Mm-hmm. So we we just really set out to make a film where uh, these characters could be your next door neighbor, whether you live in New York, Los Angeles, or Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, so and then that was just a, a really important to to us and uh, and to the actors as well. We talked about that in rehearsals and. Uh, you know, really just trying to make characters that you fall in love with a little bit, <clears throat> you laugh at them, and uh, laugh with them, and uh, hopefully when you're driving home, you turn to your uh, friend or significant other and say, <clears throat> did you know that 40% of all gun sales are done without a background check? That's kind of messed up. Is that true? And you Google it and you find out, yeah, that's true. So. Yeah, and that's something that, I, as the writer... You're not only the writer, director, and producer, but while you were creating this script and sitting down and writing it, because you do interlaced with within your dialogue are statistics. Right. How much research did you do? Because people people are going to watch a film like "Is That a Gun in Your Pocket," which is you know, I mean, you got women dying, men's you know, AK forty sevens, bright pink, and right. you know, really over the top slapstick visual comedy but there is such seriousness underlying that and it isn't just ha 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 which a lot of people may think that that you do have the facts and figures peppered throughout this film yes uh i did a ton of research to be honest with you uh and there's a lot that's not in the film because you, you know you walk that fine line uh i just didn't want to hit people over the head mm-hmm. I wasn't making a documentary uh, that's something that I would, le- you know, I wish the left would understand. It's not a documentary. This is just you, you try to have something that's very entertaining. You laugh at yourself, and then you, you know, like I said, you walk out and you say, "Hmm." And, and did you also know that that the Second Amendment individual right to bear arms is only eight years old? It's only from 2008. Is that true? Yes, it's true. So you know, we just try to pepper it in and um but there was a lot of research in it and actually the film I, I wrote the first draft 19 years ago wow so yeah so it's taken all that time to get it to the screen and uh in that time you know you have uh columbine newtown virginia tech uh, it just goes on and on and on yeah i mean uh, just this so, just this yep. weekend in minnesota again and yep. in philadelphia yep. philadelphia yeah I, mean, just, I know. It just doesn't stop, unfortunately. But what you also do is you crafted this script. It, it's not just, you know, ta- you know, talking about, you know, women abstaining sex until their husbands get rid of guns, um, which sets up great comedic moments. But you also touch on, that brings in, sets the stage for issues of family, right. teen, teen sex and abstinence, women's yep. rights. The power of the press in reporting and the responsibility of the media. I mean, you really bring in all the hot-button topics of today. You know, Demi, I'm, I'm so thrilled, actually, that, you're, that, you, that you picked up on this, because it's, it, it really is in there. You know, it was just, and that's why it took so long to, so many drafts, and kind of weaving this in, um... And I'm just really glad that you, you picked up on it, because at the end of the day, it really is a story about love. That's really what mm-hmm. this movie is about. You know, the, the other, other issues are kind of, uh, they're, they're actually even tangential. Um, so, yeah, the family, the power of the family, all of that, it's, it's in there. And, um, you know, just when you're talking about teen, teen uh, uh, abstinence, just... 
the line where the mom says to the daughter, you know, if he loves you, he'll wait. And, you know, just things, just little things that mm-hmm. hopefully people are watching it, um, you know, they, they pick up on that. And from the political bent, it's funny, we, we just had a, a screening uh, this last weekend in New York, which went very well. Mm-hmm. And a young gal came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, I got to tell you something. I wasn't registered. I wasn't sure if I was registered to vote or not. So right when this movie finished, I went online and I checked and made sure uh, that I was registered to vote. And uh, that made me feel really good because in our Q&A, I was basically saying, you know, elections of consequences, guys. So, you know, it it just there's a lot of layers um, and uh, it, it just took a long time to carefully craft them. And I'm I'm so thrilled about the actors who are able to really, you know, portray the nuances and, and uh, amazing uh, department heads from cinematography, uh, you know, great producing with my partner, Lori Miller. Just lots of stuff that went into it, and I'm just really thrilled that you, uh, that you recognize that. I'm really, really thrilled, so thank you. And, you know, from a storytelling standpoint, the fact that nothing is black and white and you are showing both sides of the coin in every single instance here. And that's very difficult to do with this many polarizing topics mm. and also still staying under the banner of comedy without turning it into a parody. Well, right, or, or without slipping into that sanctimonious uh, mm-hmm. position, you know. And, it, and there's a couple times where I kind of feel like I went right up to that, you know, right up to that point and just, that, you know, hopefully people don't feel like, you know, oh, I, I, I just felt uh, preached to. Uh, we were really careful. Um, so, yeah, just uh, so, like I said, I'm, I'm thrilled. Now, was it always your plan to direct this project? You know, it was. I have I have a friend of mine who is a very well-known director. He's a, he's a fantastic director. He's actually my college roommate. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's actually off uh, directing Chappaquiddick right now. And he loved the script, and he wanted to direct it. And I just said, you know, I I love you, but I I got to do it. I got to do it myself. So, and that's another reason why it took 19 years. <laughs> <laughs> so well, and now, beca- and I'm sure you know, with so many drafts changing and the way times have changed over the past 19 years, once you made the decision to direct, when did the visualizations? Because this is it's. As I mentioned, it's very visual, and there's a lot of visual slapstick here that is what helps keep it entertaining. Right. When did the visualization start coming in? Because there again, you've got to find a rapier line. You've got to walk. Right. Um, well, you know, when I'm sitting in my room alone writing, I, I visualize as I'm writing. So there was an awful lot done in the, in the screenplay stage. Then after that, it was the next step was I, I got to get a town that is a character. You know, Rockford has to come alive. You ha- you have to feel like, even though you've never been to this place, you you can see it. You know, it's almost like Mayberry RFD was a town. Mm-hmm. You know, as a character. So um, that took a little bit of research, and actually, I I needed a a place that was in Texas that had orange groves, that was close to the border, uh, all of these things that were in my head and in the script. And I kind of settled on an imaginary town not far from a place called McAllen, Texas. And we actually just were in a film festival in uh, the, the town next to McAllen, which was kind of bizarre. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Um so then it then it was a matter of getting the right department heads. You know, we have an amazing production designer, mm-hmm. Franco Carboni, uh, who helped you know, help me visualize things and we just talked very uh, a lot about what the look of this is. What what do, what do these houses look like? Uh down to, you know, can you, I want a clock that has uh, rifle hands on it. You know, just to create flavor. Uh, and then we have an amazing DP, uh, Armando oh, Salas. Armando's work yeah. is just stunning yeah, he's, in this film. he's phenomenal. You know, it's funny. We had, I, I'm, I don't know if I should say this, but we had 
like one of the top comedic DPs out there right now. Does all you know these huge, big budget comedies, and he was interested in in being a DP for us. And then man, Amando and Laurie and I talked about this. We're like, what do we do? And I just said, you know, I think I think we got to go with Armando. This guy, you know, he has such a strong visual sense, and he had he was so good with story. You know, that's a that's a great lesson I think for DPs out there. Uh, if there's anyone listening, when you can sit in with a director and basically say, "This is what I like about your story," or what I don't mm-hmm. like, and and this is how I think we can achieve it visually. I don't know what you're thinking, and then you have this dialogue, and it's fantastic, and it's so creatively inspiring. And that is uh, why I just I basically said to Lori, and Lori agreed. We we gotta we gotta get this guy. Well, I mean, uh, what what you and Armando have d- have developed with your visual tonal bandwidth, you know, there's this light, bright visual tone. Mm-hmm. The color is saturated, so right. you get that heightened sense of reality. Exactly. I love that your exteriors are always sunlit and very bright, right. metaphorically equating to our eyes being opened wide and seeing something. Right. Everything's out in the open. You know, there are no, there's nothing metaphoric in the shadows in shadows in this film, but for Cyrus Rockford himself and this dark mysticism of who is this person, what does he represent, which kind of is the cloudy issue of the whole political nature of the beast. Right. But it is just so well visualized. And then you have your little touches with your production design and your set decoration to even bring in to, you know, set at home for people that don't quite understand issues, but they know pop culture. You got a picture of gun toting Charlton Heston on the desk of the, <laughs> of the national rifle guy. Right. Um, that was just uh, that you lost me with that one. I, I was just, <laughs> but all these tiny little touches, a lot of touches that yeah. play into, you know, you've got your visual metaphor, you've got your, your subtext going on so well done. And then you bring in these performances and no less than Cloris Leachman, who steals every scene. <clears throat> yeah, she is definitely a scene stealer, no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and Cloris, I think, is very important in your casting because she is the one that always calls it like she sees it. <laughs> On and off camera. <laughs> Did, I I have had the pleasure of knowing Cloris off and on for years and interviewing oh, wow. her multiple times. And, yeah, it's it's like wrangling cats when you're with Cloris. Yeah, we should we, we should sit down and exchange stories <laughs> one day. Well, we're actually going to do that tomorrow because I'm going to uh, we're doing a sit down tomorrow with Andrea. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. But how did you come out with your casting? Because really stand out for me, Matt Passmore, Andrea Anders, and of course then you bring in the fabulous John Michael Higgins as Mayor uh, Wally, who is just the epitome of political buffoon. Yeah. No, okay, yeah. maybe not the epitome. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think we have uh, some that will eclipse that. At least one I can think of. But we'll leave that one alone. Um, <laughs> no, I, I know. We were very fortunate to get him. I, we had a, a, a terrific casting director, Ronnie Esco. And, um, you know, it, the casting... I, I, look, most of directing, in my opinion, is casting. Uh, and, and you, you know, by the time you're done, if you get the right department heads and the right cast, you almost have to be, and if you have a decent enough script, you almost have to work at making a bad movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how I feel. So um, we had, the, the casting was, was tough. Uh, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of speaking roles in the movie. I, think, I can't remember, it was 37 or 47. I, think it was I was like going to say, because all of your townspeople, everybody's contributing something. Yes. Exactly, and uh, it's a lot. And, you know, you you have to sit and audition a lot of people, even for one line. So um, it's it, it it was rough, and the toughest, believe it or not, was the male lead. And Matt, we actually pushed production a week because I was just feeling you know, people came in and and they were great at one thing, but just mm-hmm. something was not something was off. And um, we pushed production a week. And then Matt came in Friday, 5 p.m. He was the last person to come in the door. And we were actually, we had a reading scheduled for 7 o'clock that night Mm -hmm. with our cast. 
And as of 5 p.m. on Friday, I wasn't sure who the lead was going to be. That's wow. What to, it came right down to the wire. And he came in, and and uh, and Lori was instrumental in this, too. Because by the time, I was kind of numb, to be honest with you. I was like, yeah, I really I like him, I, but I like this other guy, too. I don't you know, what do we do? And she's like, Matt Passmore. Matt Passmore. And I'm like, okay. let's." And, and he came in, he read at the 7 o'clock reading and mm-hmm. blew us all away. And I was like, oh, my God. And I was very thankful, very well, thankful for Lori. I, I got news for you. On screen, not only does he have a great chemistry with Andrea Anders, yeah. who plays yeah. Glenn's wife, Jenna, right. but the scenes between Matt and Garen Stitt, who plays yeah. his, his son, kid. That is another, the chemistry there is equally important. And you see, everybody always thinks of a mother-daughter dynamic. We don't really get to see father-son dynamics unfold. And Can I tell you another interesting one? Do you yes. Have, do you have a second to hear another of interesting course. story? We had uh, a different screening last week. It was at the New York Film Critics Society. It was a great screening. And two young uh female teachers came up to me afterwards and said, listen, I, you know, we really loved your movie, and I want to tell you something. I, it, thank you for creating the, the scene between um, Gar- uh, Garen and um, Matt where they talk about you know, vulnerability mm-hmm. it's at the end of the movie. And they were saying how it's such a great lesson for, that they try to teach their the little boys in their in their classrooms, you know, about growing up and what kind of man to be, mm-hmm. and it, it was it was a great compliment, and I was really happy about that. Uh, I hope that's not too big a digression, but it just oh, not at all. When you were talking about that, no, I mean because that just that just solidifies what I was picking up on the film. You know what I it, what struck me when I was watching it. Those you know those things mean so much, especially in today's day and age, and with your subject matter here you know let me ask because i know that you have been a stand-up comedian another lifetime but yeah <laughs> you know another lifetime but you, right. you never lose that right how important is that experience that life experience when you're creating a script like for is that a gun in your pocket i think it's really more about timing and um i think it comes in probably more handy actually in directing than in the writing process because you kind of have a a better sense of timing so that when you're watching actors uh, or especially in the audition process and you and you see somebody that just has you know you know that they have the right timing so uh you know even if they may be let's say a little over the top or something like that you got to trust yourself that you can kind of bring them down but you know they're going to nail the timing Mm -hmm. so i think it's it's really useful in uh in that sense and i think in the writing it's just helpful i've been writing jokes since i'm you know 12 years old so um i don't think that that ever i just think that's such a big part of my personality Mm mm-hmm so uh, it's really hard for me to separate that as a writer. But, it, it, again, it definitely comes in useful in directing. Because I know I, I've spoken with other writers and directors and the, that have done comedies. or They've tried to do laugh-out-loud funny comedies. And it's just they're just missing the mark on not, not just the timing, but the dialogue itself. Right. And I think you really need to have that kind of comedic sensibility in your blood. I do, too. I don't think it's something that can be learned. I really don't. I think it's, uh, you know, it's funny. Someone asked me at that New York uh, Society screening, uh, you know, who are your comedic influences? Because they just thought the movie was very funny. And I said, well, really, my number one comedic influence is my father because he's just freaking funny as hell. (laughs) You know? So I think it is. I just do think it's in your blood. It's in your DNA. Uh... Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So now the film is already open in New York, and it's opening in Washington, D.C., and here and in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles this Next Friday. Week. Right, and it's also in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, it opened in Scottsdale and New York. Because I know you've got a whole platform thing going. Right. And for anybody who needs to find out where you can see this hilarious film, the you can go to the film website, isthatagun.com. Right. 
and uh, I think the trailer comes on. If you kind of X out of the trailer, there's a, 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 a banner at the top that lists all the theaters and tells you. And but in Los Angeles, we're at the um, Music Hall Lemley in, in Beverly Hills. On Will, know, at Wilshire and Doheny. Wilshire and Doheny, yeah. So that's where we are. And, uh, and yeah, come on out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, Matt, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. This has been so much fun. I can't wait to sit down and talk to you tomorrow. I, I can't wait to sit with you, Debbie. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much. It's, it's really a great feeling as a writer when you sit and talk to somebody and they actually say, do you know I noticed this and this in your movie? And you're like, oh, thank God. Because <laughs> you know? sometimes you, you can have a conversation with somebody and they're like, it's like they didn't even watch the movie or something. They just don't don't get it. It's so nice to have somebody that gets it. You know, really I, d- I just, uh, very quickly, I just moderated some Q&As last weekend. And in both instances, the talent said to not only myself, but they said to the publicist there that why didn't I moderate the other Q&As for their film? Because I saw the film and the other moderators had not. It was oh, evident. Um, when they ask questions about the film that didn't even pr- like subtitles, and there weren't any. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's called foot and mouth disease. <laughs> so you know, you know, I always like to make all of you feel because I know, having been on the other side of the camera, I know how much work you put into goes into every production, and yeah. it's the it's paying attention to these little details that. That make or break a film and a story. Uh, look, I, I edited. I got stuck in that editing room for a, over a year. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely because it's a whole other ball of wax. Yep. Just editing. Yep. Well, Matt, again, thank you so so much. I will see you tomorrow. And in the meantime, everybody, is that a gun? dot com? Go to the website, find out where it's playing, and go see it. Thank you, Debbie. I really look forward to meeting you tomorrow. Thanks, Matt. Bye bye. Uh, take care. Bye bye. And that was Matt Cooper, writer, director, and producer of "Is That a Gun in Your Pocket?" And yes, trust me, it's worth seeing Cloris Leachman, without a doubt. And right now, I am so thrilled to have the lovely Nadia Litz with me. Are you there, Nadia? Oh, hi. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing really well. What's what's it been? A whole ten days since we last spoke. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, the film has come out since then, and um, I've been enjoying my time in LA. So it's good to speak with you again. It is a pleasure to speak with you. Now, for those that don't know the, what the People Garden is, give a give a brief description with no spoilers. I know. It's hard to talk about this film and press without giving spoilers. Um, But basically, a young woman travels to uh, Japan to to break up with her boyfriend. And when she arrives, uh, she's found out that he's gone missing. And it then becomes... And incredible. (laughs) Well, it it turns into a mystery. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got, you know, but the whole film, it's hauntingly beautiful. It is. Oh, thank you. From a story standpoint, from your visual standpoint, and with Dree Hemingway's performance as, Mm. as Sweet Pea, who is looking for the, her missing man. And, how did, where did the idea for the people garden come from because this story is something it's out of the mainstream this is this yeah. this is not you know we there aren't films out there like this um yeah for sure you know i think it's sometimes hard to describe where these things come from but i can kind of give you two paths um, mm-hmm. that that led me to make this film. Um, you know, I was coming out of university when I was, I was writing this, and I was studying film theory and, you know, what is known as auteur cinema. And among that group, there's so few female directors, and there's so 
few female driven stories. So, um, being young and, uh, female and a filmmaker, I really wanted to, um, you know, contribute more to that, um, side of things. Uh, you know, someone like Lynn Ramsey, she has this film called Norman Collar. Um, obviously Sofia Coppola, you know, for any young woman, um, she's had some type of impact, like something like the Virgin Suicides. And so, um, I really wanted to make a film that was female driven and, and about this, this young woman, Sweet Pea, who, uh, was, you know, trying to solve a mystery that essentially was right. The answer was right in front of her, you know, the whole time. Um, and, and then the forest is also part of the journey of this story, um, again, in university, was studying Japanese cinema and literature, and there's this very odd um, but compelling book called The Complete Manual of Suicide. Um, and it, it was written by this Japanese author um, almost as a very kind of political satire um, you know, novel. And in that novel, The, the Forest is mentioned. And so I started kind of visualizing um, that place in my imagination from from all angles. And um, so, yeah, somehow those two ideas kind of converged and the film was the result. Now, as you're writing, because you are an actress, do you find in the writing process that it helped you with your character development on the page and then also while mm -hmm. you were directing? Because this is not a very verbose film. There's a yeah. lot of silence, and I mean silence. It is very reflective, <laughs> very contemplative, mm -hmm. um, and that just is so strikingly beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think for me, I think the script um, probably had more narrative information. It probably had more dialogue. Um, when you meet uh, an actor that you feel is really right for the part that has something that is so very connected to the part that you've written, um, which I had when I had Dree Hemingway, you kind of adjust things for their strengths and what makes mm -hmm. them really, um, really shine on, on camera. And Dree is so good at playing so much on her face uh, with very little dialogue. And, you know, frankly, that is a kind of, you know, acting that I, I, in many cases, prefer. Um, yeah, I mean, the scripts are very descriptive, um, and so I think I give a lot to an actor, and maybe that's mm -hmm. because of my uh, acting background. Um, but I give, what I give them are clues and not answers. It's, you know, much like the film. I feel like you develop a relationship with an audience when you put a film out there and they actually become authors of the film too. And so, you know, that silence and stillness that you're talking about is a way for an audience to engage with their own experiences and to fill in the blanks in a way that, um, that can be then a relationship with the film rather than a film coming mm -hmm. out and, um, you know, telling you how you should feel, telling you exactly what the story is. And for some people, that's really frustrating, that kind of filmmaking. And for other people, you know, like myself, it's like the whole point of filmmaking is to kind of really engage with a, a, um, a project and think about it and to add in the blanks, you know, with your own experiences in your life to kind of stir up some, you know, personal emotions or personal experiences. So, yeah, that's, that's how I, I, I saw this film. Yeah, you know, and it's funny you say that because, I mean, this is very much a thinking film. You create mm -hmm. a lot of ambiguity. You do create questions, and you leave many things open for the audience mm -hmm. to interpret as they choose to based on their life experience and their emotional level. Yeah. And the, I always find those films to be so engrossing. Uh, granted, I love to see a film, you know, a tentpole blockbuster that is just a pure adrenaline rush. Totally. But that's... <laughs> I do too. <laughs> but, you know, that's... When I go to see that, it's because that is what I want to see at that moment. Yeah. You yeah. Know, experience... Oh, for sure. I mean, it's the same with... It's the same with, like, television and, 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 and music, you know. Like, there's music that I'll listen to that's, like, 
aggressive hip hop, you know, but then I'll do like um, a really kind of slow, melancholy, like symphony, you know, like it, it has so much to do with kind of just your needs at that time. So yeah, I also like blockbuster films when oh. I'm in the mood for that. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's nothing better because you can just escape and you don't have to think. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, this you'll... is not that. <laughs> no. And... This, this is, but this is not, but I would also say like there, I mean, and there are degrees of, of um, that kind of, um, you know, fill in the blanks that, that you can have. And I think in this film, like, I, I think that there's enough in there that is sort of satisfying and, like, like mm-hmm. totally a good place to to be in, to feel for a lot of people. Um, and then that extra sort of added work that they need to do can be kind of, you know, fun if you're mm-hmm. if you're in the mood. Well, you, you know, know, it'll be not fun if you're not. <laughs> you, you know, I mentioned the, the sound and the silence, but... Yeah. Hand in hand with that silence, and I know because so much of our audi- of our listening audience are filmmakers, uh, and people in yeah. the and people in the business, and what you do with your sound design, you can hear wind through leaves mm-hmm. through grass, and it's all very distinctive as to what it is. Dree's footsteps, which we talked about, and I was so happy she yeah. actually walks and doesn't just schlub her feet across the ground. Mm-hmm. You know, all of these little things that so often are taken for granted or no attention is paid because of the silence and the minimal dialogue, you really make sure that we get that ambient scope. How, how, yeah, how you know, long was for that? For me, it's edited? like about casting a spell a little bit. It's one of those movies. And so you're trying to kind of orchestrate everything um, that you shoot and then in the post production, including sound, to sort of orchestrate this way for people to kind of get locked in and then mm-hmm. a spell to be cast. That's the way that we talked about it a lot in the edit, and that's the way that we talked about it in the sound design. Um, we also, you know, there's not a traditional score for this film. Um, we're definitely not dictating, um, you know, how you should feel in any given scene. We have um, really excellent kind of uh, soundtrack by this artist who's, uh, Taiwanese, American, Canadian, um, who goes by various monikers, but including uh, Dirty Beaches and it, like indie music fans will know his name for sure. He's kind of famous for doing dinner parties for David Lynch. Um, <laughs> but he, his collection of uh, songs, we almost like DJed. We used it as like the backdrop of, of, uh, of the music in the film. But other than that, there's no score. And so the score, the sound effects of the forest and what you're talking about, like the wind and the way that the, the leaves um, feel or the way that there's, there's actually um, sounds that are inorganic that are mm-hmm. thrown in there for extra kind of tension, that's really just, again, like you're not overtly scoring a film and telling people cry here, feel this here, but you're just subtly kind of creeping in. Um, and that was, really, that was really the approach. How long was the edit, editing process with your sound designer and editor just to achieve that? Yeah, you know, that... the funny thing <laughs> is, I mean, the edit was, um, the edit process was quite extensive. Um, it was around six months. But the sound design, you know, we're an independent film, so you, you don't get a lot of time. I think mm-hmm. we maybe have three or four days. Um, but the idea of behind the sound design was very like kind of clear in my mind, even writing again, like if you, the actual reading of the script, all of those kinds of or- organic and inorganic sort of sounds are somehow descriptive in, in the script itself. And so it becomes really easy. And it's, it's honestly like sound design people love, <laughs> love films like this. They love to orchestrate and almost like create a tune with sound effects. And mm-hmm. it's, it's really something special to watch as well. Um, not a lot of time could have used more always, but, you know. Well, you know, hand in hand with the sound are your visuals. Your cinematographer, Catherine Lutz, has done an amazing job. Mm-hmm. Now, as, as, as I had mentioned to you the other week, you know, some of the most striking visuals are in the forest, particularly at night with moonlight and the clouds going passing over the moon and then the the light and shadow playing on the trees in the forest 
it is breathtaking. It is so stunning to watch that. Did you know that, did, was that a pre-planned idea or what was the process for you and Catherine? Were you storyboarding? Were you plotting yeah. out um, specific imagery? Because some, you've got perfect framing and it is very deliberate and you can look at it and I can tell. It was very deliberate right. for that moment, which we're not going to say because it would be a spoiler. <laughs> uh, but, <Yeah. laughs> but then you have others that are this more ethereal effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think deliberate is a really good word for this, um, for this film, um, in terms of the, the shots. Um, yeah, it's a lot of planning. Um, you know, again, I think for this particular film, and I don't think all scripts that I write are like this, but for this particular film, a lot of that is just written on the page, um, and really distinct sort of, um, descriptions of, you know, lighting, and then Catherine is such a brilliant, um, brilliant cinematographer that she can kind of take what's on the page and then add in a bit of her aesthetic. I was really a, a big fan of her photography work. I mean, mm -hmm. she's done some films she's known in Canada, but I, I'd seen her photography work, and it's really, it's really got the same sensibility that I, I love. It's kind of like you know, darkness, but somehow there's always like this kind of glow coming from within. She, she's she's so yeah. good at that. And our production designer, who I, I need to also, like, shut out, because it's, for for me, it's, like, everything is, like, you know, like, hand works hand in hand. Like, if there isn't something kind of beautiful to shoot, then, you know, the cinematography doesn't look good. And, and um, there's the minimalism in this, you know, production design has to be so kind of strong that these, like, the few set pieces um, really stand out. So Zosha McKenzie also did a really great job. So yeah, there was storyboarding. Um, there's a lot of collage making. I'm not the greatest drawer. <laughs> so my storyboards are often like, um, you know, not sophisticated, but I'm very, very good at pulling references. I make, you, you know, I'll pull references from films. We were looking a lot at the movie Clute. Um, in terms of how to handle, you know, darkness, for example, and the kind of how dark can you go, um, so that we're, but we're still reading things um, on the screen. So that was a really big um, influence. We did, you know, Melancholia, you know, um, Lars von Trier's film. So there's this kind of slightly otherworldly, but everything is still really mm -hmm. grounded in reality. I like Kiyoshi Kurosawa um, films because he has this kind of banality to it that really appeals to me. And for all those, like, men who are working in the forest, um, this kind of combination of, like, sterility, like, a sterile environment. Um, and so, and, and, and the framing is very, you know, formal for most of the film. It and is. then as Sweet Pea is kind of becoming more vulnerable, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit looser in, until sort of the very end as well. So, uh, and then it's, you know, the only handheld part in the entire film. So yeah, very deliberate and, um, planned out and still on a budget and every, the team did an incredible job, you know, so. Well, and something else you did incredibly beyond getting Dree as your lead, as your lead actress, Jai West, uh, just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find him? Because he essentially, he is the the helping hand with yeah. Dree Sweet Pea. Without yeah. saying what's happening, he's trying to lead her and give her yeah. cl clues, the same clues effectively that we are getting. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, a really important role um, of Mac and really, really hard to find um, someone who's as good as... Um, uh, as, as as Jay um, West, he is a uh, he's from Vancouver, but has lived in Tokyo for ten years. Wow! I we looked so hard for this role because it's an incredibly difficult um, role. Again, so much unsaid uh, with his, so much backstory um, not spoken, but there mm -hmm. and in subtle ways. And a lot of people who watch the film twice pick up on that storyline a little yeah. bit more. Um, he, on, I, I think he showed up two days before we were at camera, like that's, we were casting that role into the, um, very end and, you know, sometimes like the film gods smile on you and 
somehow we met somebody who was a casting director who knew him and recommended him. And within, I think before he even said a line of dialogue in his taped audition from Tokyo, um, I phoned my producers and said, like, we have him because he did this little introduction where he, like, spoke to me directly. He's one of the kindest, um, most thoughtful actors, and I think he's so much one to watch um, in terms of... um, you know, discoveries. Uh, I, I, I can't say enough good things about him. You know, I mean, it's, and, you know, I'd said it before, you know, about Dree is luminous. The camera loves her, you know, yeah. e- equally so. And you don't normally say that about a, a male actor. But with Jay, yeah. the camera loves him. But more importantly, yeah. he knows how to use the camera to the character's best advantage. Yeah, absolutely. Like he, he's he's a star, man. He's he's really, really good. I agree about that kind of luminous quality somehow. Um, you know, we we debuted at this really amazing festival called the CC in Buenos Aires, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of you know Canadian film that takes place in Japan, premiering in Argentina. If that makes perfect sense to me, <laughs> but he came from Tokyo to Buenos Aires to promote the film with us and. Wow. Um, young women were going pretty crazy for him so he has that like i I don't know to me he's um he's very singular but you know like dree you know i think she's a very singular actress as well i think um that's one of the things i'm most kind of proud about in terms of this casting is we have really really interesting actors and jay is definitely one of those and of course we would be remiss not to mention pamela anderson (laughs) of course yeah it's a small role and she has what maybe yeah. three lines of dialogue <laughs> but oh, there's a few more <laughs> a few more but what she says and what she represents is is the linchpin in this storyline yeah i think it's i think it's um i think it's important i i think um you know so many of the characters in the film are you know trying to hide who they are they're they're trying to um, keep what is below the surface below the surface. Mm-hmm. They don't want to kind of face the truth, whether it be 529 and his views of the forest, whether it be Jay and, uh, or sorry, Mac, um, and, and why he's in the forest, um, what's kept him there when he clearly isn't the same as the other, um, the yep. other men, whether yeah. it be Sweet Pea with her relationship. But the Signe, you know, she knows herself, I think, that character. And I think Pamela Anderson knows herself and is, you know, unapologetic about the life that she's lived and unapologetic about the fact that she wants to still grow as a woman. And that's, you know, who, you know, Signe is as well. Um, it's just a point of view, you know, in the mm-hmm. film. Every, everyone kind of represents a little different point of view of how one might choose to go throughout their life. Mm-hmm. And Signe is is that one option of someone who, you know, is just unapologetic about what she's done. And, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th- there couldn't have been a more perfect casting for the role of Signe <laughs> than Pamela. But, uh, and you, you were not kind to Pamela in her scenes. I mean, she's hanging in harnesses and <laughs> swinging in the air. I mean, that's... You know, a lot yeah, I think, it, you know, you're, you get kind of worried because she's up there and it's like the rain, you know, it's not a rain machine, it's real rain. It's and real rain. She's up there, uh, like high above, and she, you know, we're like, she's freezing and she, you know, this is Pamela Anderson, you have to take care of her, of course, and she would be like, as soon as she got to the ground, she'd be like, put me back up there, <laughs> like I'm having the time of my life. She's really, really a team player and, and committed to making you know, great art. She was signed on before this film to do Werner Herzog's latest film. And we had the same casting director and that film kind of fell through and she was really itching to do um, independent cinema Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, read the role and and responded to it and called me from Malibu. I was in my bedroom in Toronto and she called. (laughs) We spoke for an hour and a half and, you know, she's a very, very smart, um, self-aware um, funny, charming, like kind person. Mm-hmm. You would want her in every movie, <laughs> like yeah. for that reason. She's just a team player. She's great. And for Pamela Anderson fans, this is this is something we haven't seen from Pamela before. 
but even with her limited screen time, she is riveting and you gravitate towards the character of Signe and you're really listening and paying attention to what she has to say. Yeah. No. Yeah, I think that's true. Well, Nadia, I can't thank you enough for joining me today on Behind the Lens. This has been so much. Thank you so much. Now, where can people find the People Garden? Um, It still might be playing in a couple of select theaters, which if you have a chance to see it in the theater, it's obviously better because of all of that um, that great work that we did. (laughs) Um, But it's also available on iTunes and a few other online platforms. Um, So check it out if you're interested in something just a little bit different. (laughs) And trust me, you know, it's well, it is well worth your time and your money. It is truly, it, it's an, it is a movie going experience of a subtle yet haunting nature. Thank you so much, Debbie. Nadia, thank you. And I, I look forward to your next project. Excellent. Well, I'm working hard on it now. <laughs> well, I want to hear about it when it's ready. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nadia. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that was Nadia Litz talking the people garden so brian we got we got what do we have time for clip two clip two of oliver stone do okay um actually i have a better idea we'll hold oliver stone for next week why don't we take a very quick break and we'll come back and do a wrap up and give a big shout out for videots okay we're gonna take a a break we'll be right back And welcome back to the final minute or so of this week's Behind the Lens. Um, Trust me, anybody out there in Los Angeles, in Washington, D.C. area, New York, Scottsdale, Arizona, get thee to a theater this week to see, is that a gun in your pocket? It is timely, it is topical, um, and it is, you are just going to laugh yourself silly. You're going to laugh yourself to either you pee in your pants or you cry or both, Um, especially with Cloris Leachman on board and of course Nadia huge thanks to Nadia Litz at the people garden but before we sign off today I got to give a huge huge shout out and push here for my friend Maggie McKay and Vidiots one of the last video stores around Vidiots at 3rd and Pico in Santa Monica tomorrow Vidiots kicks off its big Indiegogo campaign to help preserve, protect uh, VHS uh, and promote the collection that is going on and the educational endeavors and cinematic endeavors that Vidiots is currently involved in. They are a 501c3 corporation, so any donations you give to their Indiegogo campaign is tax deductible. Um, but check it. Check out Vidiots, uh, I think it's vidiots.com, and then Vidiots, they're Indiegogo, they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter. Their campaign launches tomorrow. We're going to have Maggie on the show and come, or somebody else from Vidiots in the coming weeks. And you'll hear more about what some of their pro- upcoming programs are. I'm going to be involved in some of them as well. So I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be really exciting. So here's to you, Maggie McKay, and a huge kickoff tomorrow for Vidiots. And their Indiegogo campaign. So, until next week, I'm Debbie Elias. This is Behind the Lens.